Hello everyone. Welcome back to this RSET webinar on Introduction to Lightning Observations and Applications, Part 2. We have a guest instructor today, Dr. Timothy Lang from NASA, and he will be talking about overview of current lightning data products from NASA remote sensing and ground-based measurements. Here is the training outline, and we have one more session left next week on April 2nd. Also, homework will be posted on the same day on our webpage, that's 2nd April. And as we mentioned earlier, a certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live sessions and submit the homework by the due date. The learning objectives for this session are as follows. By the end of this training, you'll be able to identify current lightning data products from spaceborne and suborbital sensors and uh, see how to access global lightning data products. A note about how to ask questions. Uh, so please put your questions in the questions box and we will address them at the end of the webinar. Feel free to enter your questions as we go and we will try to get to all of the questions during the question and answer session after the webinar. The remainder of the questions that we cannot address during that time will be answered in the question and answer document which will be posted on the training website about a week after the training. Next, we invite our guest instructor, Dr. Timothy Lang, for today's session. We also want to acknowledge and thank Dr. Christopher Schulz from NASA Marshall Space Flight Center, who helped us in coordinating this training. So Dr. Timothy Lang, who is our speaker today, is a lead research aerospace technologist at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. He leads the Lightning team at Marshall and serves as the mission scientist for the International Space Station Lightning Imaging Sensor, which recently completed a nearly seven-year mission mapping global lightning from space. Dr. Lang has been at NASA for more than 11 years and has spent almost 30 years being involved in suborbital field campaigns related to precipitation and lightning. So here, Dr. Timothy Lang. Uh, well, uh, welcome to this training. Um, I am Timothy Lang. I'm a NASA scientist, and I'm going to talk about uh, NASA Lightning products. Um, these come from a variety of uh, remote sensing, and uh, which is both spaceborne and airborne, and then ground-based measurements. Okay, so I'll start with just talking about the spaceborne lightning measurements. And uh, first thing to get into is how lightning is detected optically from space. So uh, all NASA's satellites that detect lightning um, throughout the years have used the uh, optical um, approach. And for that, you can imagine having essentially a, a big telephoto camera, a big telephoto lens, and it's uh, got a high speed back end where it's got a very high frame rate. And uh, essentially, this is continuously staring as the satellite flies over. And it's specifically looking at a very narrow frequency or, or, or bandwidth. Um, this is at uh, 777.4 nanometers. Uh, this is an oxygen emission band within the lightning channels. And you can see that band right here. So it's, it's very intense uh, uh, emission band that lightning emits in. Uh, when, when a channel is active. And the really nice thing about this particular wavelength is that uh, this is strong enough to be detected during both day and night. Uh, so this allows uh, daytime and nighttime detection and uh, you know, doesn't really depend on as much on the, the overall um, diurnal cycle. And, uh, and then the camera itself has a digital focal plane. Uh, this can be either a CCD or CMOS, if you're familiar with those sorts of focal planes. This is what is recording the images. Now, uh, these, these focal planes, they have individual pixels, as you can imagine, individual pixels in a digital camera. And so uh, this camera is recording 500 frames per second, but we're not really saving all that data. What we're doing is we're kind of looking at the overall background scene and we're, we're kind of looking for transients above the background. So 
what what we look for is we kind of look at an average seam, kind of a running average as we're going along. And uh, if you have a pixel that lights up above the background significantly, uh, we call that a single pixel an event. If you have uh, multiple pixels um, that light up uh, that are continuously connected, then we call that a group, and those are all in the same frame. Um, groups uh, in the lightning perspective is analogous to sort of pulses or individual strokes in in a in a radio based lightning data, or if you're looking at a a cloud to ground discharge off in the distance, and you see it kind of flicker. Those flickers is kind of like what we're talking about when we're talking about groups. And then you have uh, flashes, and these are essentially spatial spatio-temporally related groups that persist for one or more frames. So you have uh, these. So you have events that kind of uh, upscale into groups, and then you have groups that sort of upscale into flashes. And how that kind of works together is you have uh, for a given set of events, let's say we have about 12 events, uh, some of these may be their own group or, or, or a couple, two or three of them may become related to a single group. Um, note that these individual pixels tend to be a few kilometers in size. So we're talking about, you know, uh, it's kind of a small spatial area storm size uh, that we're looking at. And then these groups can get clustered into flashes. And then you can think of flashes themselves getting clustered into thunderstorm areas. Uh, so essentially, individual portions of a flash, uh, pulses within a flash, the actual flashes themselves, and then the thunderstorms where the flashes are actually occurring. That's kind of the overall hierarchy of, of how we have organized our NASA spaceborne lightning data. So the first, now I'm gonna go through and kind of talk about a lot of different data sets that, that NASA produces um, on, the, on the spaceborne side. Uh, the first of these and the oldest uh, data set is the optical transient detector. This is uh, 1995 to 2000. Uh, this satellite flew and it had a, a sort of a forerunner or, or path, pathfinder instrument on it. And uh, it was, Inclined at about 70 degrees uh, due to the swath of the instrument, it could see up to plus or minus 75 degrees latitude. Uh, it was up at 740 kilometers. And um, it operated for, for several years, sort of proved the concept uh, of, of how to do um, lightning mapping from space. Uh, and if you want to get individual lightning granules, there's a link there. Uh, so, yeah, this was the first mission to fully map global lightning from space. There's a map from a, a paper by Hugh Christian, who was the PI of the instrument uh, many years ago. And, uh, like I said, it proved the lightning detection concept. It de demonstrated how lightning favors land versus ocean. You can see that on this map, this climatology where, say, over North America, you got a lot of lightning. And then as you get off into the eastern Pacific, not nearly as much lightning. Um, sometimes certain offshore areas have, have a lot of lightning, whether there's warmer waters, like over the Gulf Stream or in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but in general, uh, lightning generally favors land versus the ocean, and, and OTD really demonstrated that, that quite nicely. And it also showed the importance of the tropics to the global electric circuit. You can kind of see how a lot of lightning over Central Africa, over tropical South America, southern United States, so tropics and subtropics, well, Southeast Asia. These are the areas, so tropical land masses are really where the lightning chimneys, if you will, are, globally speaking. And, and OTD helped kind of demonstrate all that. The follow-on to OTD was the Tropical Rainfall Measuring Mission Lightning Imaging Sensor, so-called TRIM-LIS. Um, I'll use the term LIS quite a bit uh, because we had two instruments that I'll talk about. Uh, this was the first of them. Uh, this was essentially 2018, uh, I'm sorry, 1998 through uh, April of 2015, the instrument operated. It was a very long-lived mission. Uh, it was at uh, half the inclination of the OTD instrument, so it really only focused on the tropics. It went to roughly about plus or minus 38 degrees latitude. So mostly the tropics, deep tropics, and into the subtropics, maybe a little bit of the mid-latitudes. Um, 
And uh, the, the really cool thing about TRIM, Liz, is that it wasn't just a lightning sensor there. Uh, TRIM satellite had uh, microwave radar, radars, microwave radiometers, um, visible infrared instruments, and other, other really cool instrumentation. So you could look at things like uh, radar observations from space of thunderstorms and also look at the lightning at the same time. So it's a very valuable science data set. Um, and there's a link to the individual orbit granules there. Okay, so um, as as you might have noticed, uh, Trim, Liz, and OTD actually overlap, and uh, so that's uh, two great tastes that taste great together. Uh, and you can actually combine those two data sets and look at global lightning over a much longer period, and turn that not just into individual orbit granules, but also explore kind of a climatological, like a map-based perspective a gridded perspective of, of uh, global lightning. And so this global climatology data set is a merged climatology that combines both sensors um, and they overlap during uh, uh, a few years there. And so the OTD flash rates, um, OTD was somewhat less sensitive than TRIM because it was an older instrument and it was at a higher altitude, had a bigger footprint and that tends to make it a little bit less sensitive. And so we adjusted the OTD flash rates in a scientific manner to be consistent with the trim Liz sensitivity. And then based on that, we, in, we in developed both a half degree or 50 kilometer data set and a 2.5 degree or, or 250 kilometer gridded data set. Now, all these lightning data sets that I've talked about, almost all of them are available from uh, what's known as the Global Hydrometeorology Resource Center. I'll talk a little bit about that more um, towards the end of this uh, presentation, but just know that the GHRC is kind of uh, almost completely your one-stop shopping for NASA lightning data. The other thing is because TRIM was up there for so long, uh, we got really, really, uh, you know, multiple samples, lots of samples, and that allows you to kind of average things better and drive down, uh, improve the resolution of the data set. So we also produced just sort of a standalone trim Liz climatology data set that covers 1998 to 2013. This is higher resolution. It's a 0.1 degree or about 10 kilometer resolution. And it's at, like I said, it's average over the full trim Liz mission. So it's very much a climatological uh, data set, but it looks at diurnal, monthly, seasonal, annual, et cetera, full climatological means. The really cool thing about this data set is that it allows you to explore um, relationships between lightning and geographic features like lakes or mountain ranges and the like. Uh, the example I've got here are two lakes, two tropical lakes. There's Lake Maracaibo in the uh, northern Venezuela and then Lake um, Victoria in Eastern Africa. Uh, both of these uh, lakes are well known for significant thunderstorm activity, especially at nighttime. And you can kind of see the daytime switch to the nighttime and, and the high, very high resolution of, of the trim data set that kind of captures that variability and how it clusters around the lake and nearby mountain ranges. Uh, same thing with, with Lake Victoria. So this is a very, very neat way to explore detailed spatial relationships between lightning and, and geography. Okay, so uh, Trim Liz was actually the, we actually built two of them essentially. <laughs> and one of them was a flight spare. And so the idea was, well, if, if, if something happened to the Trim satellite, we'd have this uh, spare Liz instrument uh, that could be used in a, like a replacement mission or something like that. Well, I mean, TRIM was one of the most successful NASA Earth Science satellites ever launched. Um, so we didn't have much to do with the flight spare. Uh, so it was kept in storage for a long time. Uh, but then once the TRIM mission started to go towards the, its end stages, uh, we got approval to modify the, the flight spare instrument and send it up to the ISS. And to do this, we had to kind of trick it to uh, think that it was still on the trim satellite. Uh, so we built an, a whole separate interface unit uh, to do that. And we incorporated it within a uh, US Department of Defense payload. Um, not, every, uh, not every DOD satellite is super secret and, and, and spy technology. Sometimes they're just doing basic um, 
uh, technology demonstrations. Uh, and, and so we were able to incorporate that and put that up on the space station. And, um, and then the great thing here is we got uh, several more years of data from 2017 to 2023 when that mission finally ended. Um, the nice thing about going up on the space station is, that, of course, it expanded the climatology back to uh, plus or minus about 55 degrees, so we got more coverage of the mid-latitudes. The other nice thing is, uh, while it was operating, it provided near real-time data uh, to operational end users. The big problem with getting data from satellites is bandwidth and that sort of thing. Well, the, the ISS has a lot of bandwidth. And so we're able to bring down data like every two minutes and, and put that out to operational end users, including like weather services and, and that sort of thing. Okay, uh, so what does that kind of climatology look like? Let's explore a little bit more lightning climatology. And, and for this, I'll, I'll focus mostly on ISS Liz. Um, and this is a nice looking uh, map of just sort of the six year climatology of lightning from ISS Liz. This is at a 0.5 degree resolution. And again, you can kind of see the importance of the global tropics, uh, mountain ranges like the Himalayas and um, islands and the like. And again, the, the tendency for lightning to, to very much focus on the land versus the ocean. Um, but the really neat thing about that I liked about ISS Liz is that, uh, it, of course, it went to higher latitudes, so you could kind of explore the seasonality of lightning. And so this is kind of uh, average over the whole mission. This is just sort of monthly averages of global lightning from ISS Liz. And the thing I want to call attention to here is, uh, of course, the tropics are always kind of active, but when you get into the warm seasons, either in the southern latitudes or the northern latitudes, um, those, um, those uh, lightning flash rates or lightning densities can be as, as intense as the um, as in the tropics. So even in the upper United States or northern China, during the warm seasons there, you can get very, very strong and high flash rates uh, that are comparable to what you see in the tropics. It's just it's very seasonally driven. Um, and so that's something to, to keep in mind there. Um, so that's that's the real value of the ISLIS Liz data set is you can explore that seasonality uh, more than you could with trim Liz. But you can also uh, look at things just in the tropics with both um, with both instruments and kind of look at a time series. Now here, of course, there was a kind of a two year gap of roughly 2015 to 2017 between the two sensors when they were up. Uh, but if you just look within plus or minus 38 degrees latitude, you can kind of look at monthly means and then we've got an annual running mean along with that. And what you'll see is that for almost the entire trim Liz, um, lifetime that uh, global lightning in the tropics was very, very stable. There was, there's kind of uh, some interannual variability probably associated with things like the El Nino Southern Oscillation uh, and La Nina periods and, and other various uh, seasonal and, and interannual controls on lightning. Uh, but things overall was very stable on, on average, uh, roughly about 41 flashes per second globally in the tropics. Uh, in the ISS Liz era, we were similar to that, except then this weird dip happened in 2020. Um, and of course, if you remember, that was kind of when COVID happened and, and uh, a lot of industry shut down and people stopped driving as much to work and that sort of thing. And so maybe if you believe in aerosol controls on lightning and convection that uh, if you, based on the theories and, and hypotheses associated with that, you might be able to make an argument that those reduced aerosol concentrations might have affected convection and weakened it uh, overall, um, or there, this could have been just a very, very strong La Nina period uh, as well. So we're still exploring what the ultimate cause of this dip is, but the, the important thing to know here is that, again, things have recovered in recent years. And unfortunately, of course, the mission ended, so we don't know where things stand now, uh, but it definitely seemed like lightning was on an upward trend. Now, 
And of course, with uh, global climate change, uh, we also expect lightning to increase, but probably that is going to be most prevalent at higher latitudes. And here, you know, this, this time series is just looking at lower latitudes. Uh, so maybe you don't expect as much of a significant effect here, except when you have these interesting transient uh, features like uh, might be associated with COVID or La Nina. Okay, so that's an overview of all the different uh, NASA lightning um, missions that have been in space. Uh, but I, I want to focus a bit on uh, an important metadata variable for these data sets, which is called view time. Um, when you're flying something in low Earth orbit, uh, lightning, of course, is a very volatile thing. Sometimes you fly over an area and there's no thunderstorms, there's no lightning. Sometimes it's lighting up, there's big storms everywhere. Um, so it's very volatile. Um, but no matter if you see lightning or if you don't see lightning, you always have to know, was I actually looking at that area at this time? And so that's why we keep track of this view time variable. And this metadata variable is calculated on a half degree grid. And then the view times in granules that you kind of need to bin them up and sum them up to create a global map like you have here. And here you see uh, this is a globally summarized view time for a few months in 2020. Uh, you can see reduced view times, only about 15 minutes or so total time over much of the tropics. And then, but a lot of view time up in the higher latitudes. This is due to the shape of the orbit. You know, the instrument tends to spend more time at higher latitudes with ISS Liz up near the inclination, which is around 52 degrees of the ISS. Uh, so when we calculate the, those maps of the flash rates globally, we have to keep a track of the fact that, well, some areas we're looking at all the time and some areas we don't look at as much. And so these, this information is really important for sort of um, normalizing the data sets to create those uh, accurate uh, climatological maps like I showed earlier. Uh, one way to kind of sum up the view time is to, uh, at least in Python, I have this uh, sort of a, a simple code snippet that shows uh, uh, the SciPy package has this bin statistic 2D um, thing, uh, function that essentially you, you give it the latitudes and longitudes and then uh, the observation times and it'll bin all that up and create a nice looking gridded map like this. Uh, the other thing with ISS Liz is, of course, we're on the space station, and sometimes you have these uh, solar panels that come in into and out of the field of view, and our view time does keep track of that. It does know that, okay, you've got a panel in the way here. Uh, I'm not viewing that area right now. The other important thing we have to do with the satellite data is um, the, the instruments, you know, they're not perfect. Sometimes they get noisy or they turn off or they have have some issues that get tripped up um, and so we have to exclude orbits where you have significant problems with the data and so we have uh, flagging operations that kind of do that both automated and semi-automated op options and then we also every granule um, may be hard to believe this but we do have a scientist who's who's reviewed just about every granule from from every um, satellite orbit from TRIM and OTD and, and, uh, and ISS Liz. And they've said, okay, this instrument was clearly not functioning properly this orbit or was functioning just fine this orbit. And so we can exclude the bad orbits. And because we keep track of that view time metric, we know not to include those orbits in our view time data sets. And so that allows us to kind of keep track uh, of this. So in what you see up here on the on the top is sort of uh, uh, what happens if you don't do this. <laughs> you don't do this quality control. You end up with a map like that, and you see these weird streaks that are kind of shaped like individual orbit paths, and that's due to the instrument being in this noisy mode. Uh, and so we have to exclude the, those uh, data, and uh, when you make all those adjustments, you get a much cleaner looking map. And because, again, because we keep track of that view time, um, there's nothing lost here, so to speak. There's, you know, we, we don't have those specific orbits, but then we're not also including them in our view time metrics. So we know to normalize by, by the modified uh, view time. 
Okay, now we had ISS and TrimLiz, and those are nominally identical instruments. Like I said, one was a flight spare for the other, um, and they didn't overlap, uh, and they were on totally different satellites. Uh, so even if they were perfectly the same, you would not necessarily expect that these instruments would make the exact same measurements. They were in different orbits, they are on different platforms, uh, et cetera. And so we've done uh, complicated analysis uh, using a Bayesian framework. It's kind of a special uh, logic based framework uh, for comparing with ground based uh, commercial sensor networks. And essentially, what we found is that ISS Liz uh, likely had a detection efficiency about 5% less than trim. So trim was roughly about 65 to 70% uh, detection efficiency. ISS Liz was more like 60 to 65%. Uh, we believe that this detection efficiency is due, uh, at least in part, to the larger ISS Liz footprint sizes. It was at slightly higher altitude, but also uh, the ISS is not the perfect like nadir viewing um, uh, platform. It's canted a little bit, and uh, often does a lot of different weird gyrations to support spacecraft operations and that sort of thing. So overall, what that happens is it kind of creates ISS Liz um, pixel areas, individual pixel areas to be essentially larger than trim Liz pixels uh, in terms of physical area. And that essentially makes the instrument slightly less sensitive. So that's, that's what's happening here. So now that we know that we can kind of help uh, in the long term, we want to eventually combine ISS Liz with trim and OTD, and this information will allow us to do that accurately, even though ISS and trim did not um, overlap. The other, so trim Liz, as I mentioned, had like all these other instruments on it. Um, the ISS also has uh, different instruments that have in, in the past uh, made for good combinations with uh, the Liz instrument. Uh, there have been microwave radiometers like the Cover and Tempest radiometers. Uh, here I show a radiometer swath with the lightning kind of flashing on and off. And you see the lightning is associated with often colder brightness temperatures uh, in the microwave. Uh, we've also uh, combined with another lightning type instrument called uh, the awesome instrument atmosphere space interactions monitor. And we've overlapped with a cloud lidar cloud aerosol lidar called cats um, just for about 6 months back in 2017, but it's enough to kind of look at things like thunderstorm altitudes um, as a function of latitude, which was pretty interesting. The other thing we can do with these lightning data sets is. Um, so, and even though um, if, if the instrument itself is combined with microwave radiometer, you can create this precipitation feature database that is based on the microwave observations and incorporate lightning into that. So that was, has been done for trim. For the GPM mission, um, Liz was not on that satellite, but it was on a lot of satellites that contribute microwave information to the overall GPM mission. Um, and so you can kind of combine lightning with those individual overpasses uh, using sort of conjunctions of, of ISS Liz with the various satellites. And so then you can kind of incorporate the lightning data into with the microwave information and explore how the brightness temperatures or reflectivity structures of of uh, the different precipitation features relate to lightning. Um, this data set is not hosted at the GHRC. It's managed by Texas A&M Corpus Christi um, with Chantal Liu as the PI of that. Uh, another interesting spaceborne data set is the uh, Liz background images. Uh, so, as I mentioned, um, this, is, this works in 777 nanometers and we're taking 500 frames per second. We don't save all those frames. Uh, we kind of average them together and look at, and look for transients. Uh, but every 30 to 60 seconds, we do send down a static background image. Um, and this is essentially kind of like channel three and goes. It's like a veggie near infrared type, um, a slightly shorter wavelength though. This is not calibrated. Um, at nighttime, you don't get any kind of thermal, good thermal emission here, so you're not really, it just looks black. Um, uh, so it's most useful in the daytime, but you can see interesting features like here's an island 
And when you geolocate it together with clouds, it, it looks like um, uh, it looks like oh yeah, this is the uh, Hispaniola, and there's some thunderstorms on it. And you can add in the the ISS Liz data, so it's a way to kind of help visualize the data, especially with uh, daytime scenes. Uh, and I have software that's uh, publicly available on GitHub from the NASA GitHub um, that can be used to geolocate these images for the ISS. Uh, the other thing is ISS Liz was relocated in July 2022 uh, to accommodate a different instrument. Um, this bought us a, a little bit more time on station, um, but and we did modify everything. So it should be pretty seamless to the end user, uh, but just know that there was a relocation and we were kind of reoriented in our, our viewing uh, perspective uh, back in uh, mid-2022. Mid uh, one last thing about spaceborne data set before I go back towards the Earth. Uh, so NASA astrophysics instruments often um, have detected uh, so-called terrestrial gamma ray flashes or TGFs. Um, this is high energy radiation that's very short lived uh, from thunderstorms. Uh, this was a totally uh, unexpected phenomenon that was discovered, I think, back in the late 80s, early 90s. And um, they're probably caused by these relativistic electron av avalanches initiated by strong electric fields. Um, and they're powerful enough uh, to be observed from space. Uh, but probably what we see in space is only a small fraction of what is actually being emitted from the thunderstorm. We have data from an airborne field campaign that I'll mention later that seems to indicate that there's a whole zoo of TGFs that are out there that are probably not strong enough to be observed from space. So this is, you're only getting a fraction of data. But if you're interested in additional lightning related data from NASA, you actually have to go to the astrophysics instruments to, to, to get the gamma ray information. Okay, so uh, section two here, uh, we're gonna go back down to the earth from space. Uh, we're gonna talk about so-called suborbital lightning measurements. Now, what do I mean by suborbital? Uh, this is both ground base and airborne. The ground base can be fixed lightning detection networks that kind of persist for years at times. Um, and, or it could be a lightning network that has been uh, just deployed for a few months to support like a field campaign. And, and of course, we also have instruments uh, that we fly on aircraft to measure lighting. So the, the most important or most commonly used uh, NASA ground-based uh, lightning data for, from the science perspective is a, is a lightning mapping array. Um, there are a lot of lightning mapping arrays in the United States, and uh, so NASA doesn't operate all of them. They operate a few of them. Um, so I'll talk just briefly here a bit about how lightning mapping arrays work. Um, essentially, uh, you have a network of stations that listen in an unused uh, television channel in the VHF. And they have an antenna and receiver, and essentially it measures the time of arrival of, of static, essentially caused by lightning signals within um, within that band, uh, and it timestamps it with GPS accuracy. And because we have this very high temporal resolution, we're able to kind of essentially combine the time arrival information at all these different sensors to recreate in three dimensions where that individual burst of energy occurred. And that's essentially uh, part of the lightning channel. And essentially what you can do here is sort of map out in three dimensions an individual lightning channel. What this video is showing you is uh, all the three dimensional behavior. You've got uh, time and height here at the top with uh, time also colored uh, in the rainbow scale. And then you've got a plan view looking from above of the lightning flash. And then you've got um, longitude and, and altitude and latitude and altitude. So you can kind of see interesting level, bi-level structure of flashes <clears throat> um, associated with uh, uh, different charge layers in the cloud. Um, typically lightning uh, LMAs do a best job of mapping out uh, uh, negative leaders occurring in positive charge layers. So that's kind of this lower layer. And then you have this upper layer, which is probably associated with a negative charge, positive leaders happening in a negative charge. Um, 
So theoretically, you could do this with just four sensors stations, but really you need more than six, six or more um, to do this in a practical sense, just because there's noise associated with every measurement. Uh, every measurement is imperfect. And so the more stations you add, the more accurate your solution is. And typically with these networks, we have um, on the order of 10 or more stations is, is a pretty common uh, with the idea that maybe not every pulse gets detected by every uh, station, but enough stations detect the pulse to make mapping possible. <clears throat> there are three levels of data to, to LMA. The first level is what you saw just on the previous, and I kind of recreate a different flash here. It's just these individual source locations. Um, and it's like time and location, and you can basically plot them as dots on a map. And um, these data sets, uh, if you've worked with LMA data in the past, this is probably the most common format that you've worked it with. Uh, but no, nothing's been uh, consolidated into individual flashes or anything like that. So if you go to the level two, that's where you apply some spatiotemporal matching, kind of similar to what we did with the spaceborne data, to essentially cluster all these individual sources into flashes, and and um, so there are different thresholds that are used in the literature, but a, a common one is this 150 milliseconds and three kilometer um, threshold. Uh, and the algorithms will also keep track of the total number of sources in a flash, and you can kind of threshold on that. So if you, some flashes, you can be more confident are flashes than others. Like the, the more points in a flash, the more likely that that is not just a, a couple of noise, um, a noise bursts that aren't necessarily associated with lighting. So it, as you increase, you can actually threshold on the total number of sources in a flash as well uh, to kind of help clean your data. Uh, and then finally, the level three data, this is gridded data set. Um, one of the most common products here is uh, so-called flash extent density. And here you kind of do sort of like, you have these dots, so all the individual sources, uh, and then you cluster them into flashes, and then you kind of connect the dots in a logical manner and scientifically valid manner uh, to kind of fill in gaps where maybe uh, the, LMA wasn't resolving as much information or the like. And that's this is a great way to kind of build out and, and account for detection efficiency limitations better. And, and it builds a nice clean data set that is sort of the total number of where each grid point is like the total number of uh, flashes going through that grid point in a given unit of time. Um, okay, so that's kind of what LMA data look like. Here's, I'm going to talk a bit about NASA LMA data or NASA LMA networks. Uh, the most oldest one that we have is the North Alabama Lightning Mapping Array. This is based out of where I'm at in Huntsville. Uh, it's been operational since the early 2000s, so it's been around for a couple decades now. Um, it's been used extensively to validate. I mean, the, why we put these things out is to help validate spaceborne lightning observations. So. Um, that that's the purpose of these things, but we also maintain them and they're, and they're, they stand alone as their own useful scientific tools. Um, and, uh, we do provide real time imagery available on the web and, and we also provide the daily, uh, full rate data that's processed, uh, daily and provided by the GHRC. And this is a map of the coverage. You can see it covers much of, uh, Northern Alabama as well as into, um, Tennessee and a few other nearby states like uh, Georgia and Mississippi. Uh, the other permanent NASA networks are the District of Columbia and Wallops Flight Facility LMAs. Um, one of these networks is kind of based around Washington, D.C. The other is based down here on the um, Delmarva Peninsula, kind of near the border of uh, Virginia and Maryland. That's uh, where Wallops Flight Facility is, the NASA uh, Wallops Flight Facility. And um, you can do two things with these data. You can kind of process those two networks as their own thing, um, but we're also working on combining the networks together and, and because they kind of uh, sense similar areas and, and you combine that as sort of so-called mid-Atlantic LMA. And uh, we do plan to uh, provide that data set um, more regularly in the future publicly. Um, 
But for now, we do host data subsets from these on, on our LMA networks. Um, okay, so that was kind of the permanent networks. And now we're going to talk about um, sh more shorter deployments. Uh, one was for a project called Shuva back in 2011 and 2012. This was in the, the Sao Paulo region of Brazil. Uh, it was also, there were other weather radars and the other ground-based lightning networks that were there. So it was a great way of kind of cross-checking various different lightning networks against each other. Uh, those data, I believe, are hosted on the Shuva project website. Uh, if one is interested in lightning over um, the Sao Paulo region. There was also the Relampago LMA. This was deployed to the Cordoba province in Argentina during 2018 to 2019. This has supported uh, two international field campaigns that were kind of combined together called Relampago Cacti. Um, and the LMA itself was mainly there to support uh, geostationary lightning mapper validation. That's the geostationary sensor that I believe will be the subject of the third training module um, that you folks will go through. And uh, at any rate, um, this covered very intense convection near the Cirrus de, de Cordoba range. If you're familiar with, uh, if you're not familiar with uh, the mountain ranges in South America, of course, you got the Andes that's like on the border between Argentina and Chile, as well as other regions. And then, then you got kind of plains east from there. And then you've got this other mountain range that kind of pops up um, in north central Argentina, and that's the Cirrus de Cordoba. And uh, really intense convection pops up there, and this data set got a great lightning, uh, 3D lightning mapping of, of that intense convection during that time period. We also just got done with uh, deploying a, a lightning mapping array to the Korean Peninsula. Um, this was May to October of 2023, so you can see all these different uh, shorter deployments of more like five to six months as opposed to years. Um, and so this covered the monsoon season and 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 there and points around that. Um, it's not yet publicly available. Uh, so if you want to request it, you can contact me through my email there. But um, we do plan to post it to the GHRC later this year. That's our hope. And uh, in terms of there's one other fixed long-term measurement. New Network um, that is not managed by Marshall. It's managed by the Kennedy Space Center, and it, its primary purpose is to support uh, launch uh, rocket launch operations from uh, Cape Canaveral. And um, so there's two networks there. One is kind of a local lightning network that can actually do three dimensional mapping of lightning, kind of like an LMA. Um, not not totally like it, but but similar to it. Um, and then uh, there's also a extensive network of, of electric field mills. These measure not, not just lighting, they also measure the overall electric field in the region. Um, so even so it can detect like elevated electric fields, uh, which is important for when you're trying to launch rockets. Um, you know, you need to kind of know, are we launching into a very high electric field region? Because that can spark a uh, uh, kind of trigger a discharge, like it's kind of like rocket triggered lightning uh, inadvertently. Um, these data are managed not by GHRC, but the, by the KSC weather data archive. There's a link there and they've got documentation and the like. Um, so this is a static network focused mainly on the Cape Canaveral region. Um, but if you're interested in, in Florida lightning data, this is a, this is a potentially a good source for it. Okay, so that was all the ground based stuff. Now we're going to talk a little bit about airborne, and then I'll talk uh, after that uh, about uh, how to get all these different data sets or examples of how to get them. Um, but let's start with uh, the airborne instruments. We have uh, a few of these. <clears throat> one is the lightning instrument package. This is probably the longest lived one. It's flown in a lot of different campaigns. This is essentially, imagine taking that KSC field mill network and instead of fixing it on the ground, you put it on to an airplane. That's essentially what you're doing there. And it's uh, so you put it on a single airplane, and because you have all these different mills that are are measuring 
uh, various vectors of the electric field. You can actually uh, essentially remap that into a three-dimensional vector uh, for the uh, electric field due to the charge in the storm. And you can also account for a charge that is getting induced on the aircraft. And so you can use this for lightning statistics. If you look at electric field changes, uh, you can also look at storm electric currents and storm charge structure uh, based on the behavior of that vector component of the field. And it's, it's quite accurate. You can see here an example of how it fits onto uh, the NASA ER2 high altitude aircraft. See the mills kind of sit in and out of uh, different points on the aircraft. Um, and they kind of fit around other instruments. So you can take a lot of other measurements uh, with, say, microwave instruments or whatever, in addition to the electric field. We do this quite a bit. So LIP uh, kind of makes, you kind of think of, uh, if you think of uh, like commercial power, you know, you stick, a, you plug in your, um, into your lamp, into the wall, you've got uh, alternating current there or AC. Uh, and then if you plug in a computer, often it has an adapter that converts the AC to uh, DC, kind of a direct current field. You kind of have that same effect in thunderstorms where you sort of have an overall enhancement in the electric field as you fly over the thunderstorm. But then, which you can kind of see this envelope of behavior in the, one of the horizontal components of the electric field, this kind of broad um, sine wave behavior here. But then you have these little transients and those are individual lightning discharges. So that's what this data looks like. And then, so you kind of get these time series of these different vectors that you put together as well as the time series of the electric field due to the charge on the aircraft, which you kind of use to subtract off and, and recover the full electric field uh, just due to the cloud. And you can kind of visualize, it's often hard to visualize this in three dimensions with a, a 2D uh, picture like this, but essentially what you have here are vectors that are kind of pointing away from where the positive charge is. That's the convention here. So here's your aircraft flying along on this flight track and it starts to get enhanced electric field, and it's from electric field, probably the charge is over here below the aircraft, so it points off to the right, and then as the aircraft passes, now the charge is more over here, and now it points off to the left. Um, so you can kind of get a sense of where the charge might be in the in the, um, in the cloud as, as you fly over it, as well as, you know, when and how often is the lightning occurring. Now, you don't need to have lightning for these electric field measurements to be useful. Um, as I mentioned, you have that DC component, that enhanced electric uh, field that doesn't necessarily sort of a sine wave as you fly over the thunderstorm or even a, a just in uh, a cloud that has getting electrified but hasn't produced lightning yet. Um, this still provides information about storm microphysics. Um, and uh, we've done a lot of these overflights of these so-called electrified shower clouds. These are just essentially things that are electrified but have not produced lightning. And they, have, they are very important to the overall electric circuit. So I just want to make a plug here for the value of this electric field measurements. It's not just for counting lightning flashes. It's for getting potentially inferring important information about the characteristics of the storm microphysics. And we've done things like compare to airborne radar data as well as in situ airborne microphysical probes to look at, you know, where's are the rime particles and, and liquid water and that sort of thing. We've also stuck these the lip uh, fill mills on a ship uh, before. Uh, that was kind of a fun uh, project to do. Uh, it's more complicated uh, process um, and, and difficult to do. But uh, we were able to recover the so-called um, Carnegie curve. And the, what happens with the electric field, the fair weather electric field, when there's no thunderstorms around, just a nice clear day or just, you know, pleasant, cloudy, just a few clouds, something like that. Uh, in UTC time, in UTC morning, uh, coordinated universal time morning, generally you have uh, reduced electric fields and then the electric field increases. And this is responding to thunderstorms globally. So you're making a point, me that the cool thing about this is you're making a point measurement at just a, a single uh, ship, say, or a single point on the ground. And it's giving you information about what's happening globally with thunderstorms. 
and that's what the Carnegie curve is telling you. So that's it was kind of cool to to do this with the the lip instrument, even though it's an airborne thing. Put it onto a ship, and and still make a a, a useful geophysical measurement. Okay, uh, that was all to say about lip. Uh, let's talk about another instrument called FEGS. This is the Flies Eye GLM Simulator, GLM Geostationary Lightning Mapper. You'll hear about that in the third module. Uh, this instrument was built to kind of support validation of that GLM. Uh, it's a array of all these individual photometers. Uh, most of them are tu tuned for that magic 777 nanometer wavelength in the near infrared that we use for lightning detection from space. Uh, but you can also swap in others that are tuned for other wavelengths. You can kind of see the array of different photometers here. It's kind of like a bunch of different little mini cameras. Um, and they're arranged, so they kind of look in all these different directions, and they arrange to kind of cover a, a 10 by 10 square kilometer area, with each photometer essentially covering a 2 by 2 kilometer pixel. Um, in the past, it's also featured uh, a high definition camera and a spectrometer as well um, for for getting additional spectral information. So here you can use FEGS to not just look at the triple seven nanometer, but also explore spectral information from from um, lightning. Uh, and this is flown twice: once in the Gozar post launch test in 2017, and then in a lot field campaign in 2023. Uh, here's an example of, of FEGS flying over a thunderstorm in, um, in the Aloft campaign. Uh, what you have here is sort of GOES IR imagery, and then you've got the GLM lightning. This is a flash extent density product that uh, is sort of the colored contours. And then you can kind of see the, uh, what the FEGS is seeing as it flies over. It kind of has this 10 by, or 25 or 5 by 5 array of uh, 25 pixels, if you will, of, of looking at lightning. And then we kind of fly it over uh, where the lightning is and you're making these spectral measurements of, of the lightning in that region. Um, so this is uh, gives you a lot of cool information about um, how physical processes in the lightning and how that manifests in the, in the optics, uh, in the optical output from the lightning. Uh, the thing we, another thing we often fly with FEGS is this electric field change meter or EFCM. This is a flat plate antenna. You can kind of see it here. It sort of looks like a target, um, but it's actually a, like a, a plate capacitor where you've got two metal plates that are spaced separately apart. And it's a, it detects electrostatic field changes due to lightning. So you have the field mills, which are detecting just the the electric field itself and are sensitive to electric field changes, but ultimately it's just mapping out the electric field. This is just giving you that delta of the electric field, just the change in the electric field. We have two channels that are controlled by different resistor capacitor decay constants, a fast channel and a slow channel that can kind of give you more different inf physical information about the structure of a flash. Uh, and it often flies with FEGS and it, of course it flew with it in Gozar and Aloft as well. So if you combine these sensors together, um, you can look at uh, op optical signals in FEGS and then the radio or sort of the radio based broadband signals from the electric field change and the electric field change meter. And uh, so one thing you can do is just sort of count pulses. You see an individual pulse here, it's uh, broadband optically, uh, all different spectra uh, are, are active with this particular flash. This particular pulse, and you also see a signal in the electric field change, uh, both in the fast channel, which is very quick response, and the slow channel, which is a slow recovery period. Um, but there's also other lightning, uh, and this gets back to the TGF thing I was talking about before. Um, sometimes uh, there's lightning that is only sensitive, only optically emitting in certain frequencies. Uh, in this case, in the UV at 337 nanometers. And so you don't get much signal in the other channels, you just get it in, in uh, 337. Uh, and you notice the inverted, uh, the waveform change is different. It goes a different direction compared to the previous flash. So you get some really interesting differences in lightning by combining these different uh, characteristics between the optics and the electric field change. 
Okay, so I'm going to wrap up here by just talking about how do you go about getting all these data sets. I had all these links, and so those links are in the slide. You can just click on those, and they should take you to the landing pages for these various data sets. Uh, but just to give you an example of how this actually works in practice. So, as I mentioned before, the Global Hydrometeorology Resource Center, this is your almost a one-stop shop for almost all NASA Lightning data, uh, with some exceptions. Um, it curates and maintains both orbital and suborbital data sets. Uh, there's also a lightning visualization dashboard, which is really useful. I encourage you to look if you want to look at lightning globally and kind of explore it, you know, zoom in, zoom out, kind of like a Google Maps type thing for lightning. Um, I, I encourage you to, to explore with that. There's a link there. Okay, so just walk through an example of oh, I want to download a NASA lightning data set. Okay. So um, let's start here. You go to this web page here, ghrc.nsstc.nasa.gov slash lightning. This is a, a way, a great stop, one uh, landing site to just kind of view and get information about a lot of different data sets. Okay, so we'll start here. We'll say, okay, let's, let's go to the data set information. Click on that. Uh, it shows you all the different NASA lightning data sets that are maintained. Uh, there's one here that's ISS Lightning Imaging Sensor. Uh, let's zoom in on that. Click on that. Um, and uh, you can see there's lots of different pot potential download options here. There's also browse imagery that you can look at. So let's take a quick look at the browse, uh, especially the monthly seasonal browse. Bring that in here. You can look at annual maps, seasonal maps, and the like. So these are just these are raw maps. Uh, uh, one thing that's important here, uh, raw maps, these are not true climatologies. They're just total flash counts. And so we have not normalized them per se by um, view time, as I described before. Um, so to keep that in mind when you're looking at these maps is they're not fully uh, normalized, uh, but they do give you a good information of where's lightning happening uh, as we go on. <clears throat> And then, uh, so the other thing you can do is you can click on the quality controlled uh, lightning data. So if you go back here, instead of going to the browse, you go up here to the download Liz data, go there. And uh, that brings you to this landing page here and you can click on download data. And you can, there are a couple of different ways to do this. One, the most intensive way to do it and, and direct way to do it is to just download individual um, Orbit granules by sort of pointing and clicking on a on a um, a simple web page format, and we provide both HDF and NetCDF format for these different um, data sets. Uh, so this is one way to do it. You can kind of get to an individual uh, set of orbit granules, and so this is all like an hour and a half's worth of data. You know, one orbit of the ISS, uh, just showing here, but. If you're like me, probably you don't want just one file. You probably want like a lot of data. Um, so you can also do that uh, through bulk uh, download. We can do search and browse uh, using the NASA Earth Data uh, website. Um, and that's probably the, the most efficient way to download data in bulk. You can get actual scripts there and the like. In terms of upcoming Lightning data sets, uh, Coming down the pipe, there's this aloft campaign I talked about, uh, ER2 and ground observations of lightning and gamma rays in tropical convection. We're hoping to get that out publicly available through the GHRC later this year. And as I mentioned with ISS Liz, we haven't quite fully integrated it within the trim and OTD climatology. Our plan is to do that, uh, and we do plan to release that by 2025, and that'll essentially replace the existing trim, LIS, and OTD data set. It'll become a ISS and trim, LIS, and OTD data set. Uh, so almost like a 28-year climatology of lighting from space. So we're very excited about that, but it's gonna take a minute for us to do that, uh, and that should come out you know, hopefully in 2025. And even though the ISS Liz mission has ended, we, we are looking at future concepts uh, for mapping lightning from space. Uh, one that we're exploring right now uh, is called CubeSpark, where we would look at uh, not just the 777 nanometer, but also 337 nanometer that had that information, uh, some extra information, complementary information about optical output from lightning. 
And also the other way to look at this is it's kind of also an LMA in space. Uh, so we're actually looking at the VHF uh, waveforms uh, from uh, terrestrial lightning emissions and, and getting that time of arrival and accounting for things like the ionosphere and, and remapping that into a three-dimensional map of lighting, but this time from space. Uh, so that this hopefully, if, if it gets off the ground, would be a very exciting uh, new way of looking at lightning globally. All right, and just to uh, briefly sum up here, some key takeaways. Okay, so we've got a wide breadth uh, from NASA of lighting data sets. Uh, we've got space war missions like OTD and LIS. Uh, we've got suborbital data sets, including ground base and airborne. Um, the granule base, those individual orbit files, they follow the sort of standardized event um, group, flash, and area hierarchy uh, in the spaceborne data. Uh, the view time metadata is very important. If you want to think about things climatologically, you need to understand when, when and where I was actually looking at a cloud and, and seeing the lightning. Uh, and we've done a lot of quality control to make sure those products are, are the best they can be. Um, in addition to these individual granules, we also provide those climatologies. Uh, and we've got two, a couple out there right now. We're hoping to incorporate ISS Liz into them and make them uh, cover an even longer period of time. And uh, those can meet a lot of different science and application needs. Um, our suborbital data sets, uh, in terms of the ground based, uh, they can come from long term deployments like months to years with LMAs and the KSC networks, or you can have these airborne data sets. Uh, and they kind of come from short term campaigns, usually not more than 100 flight hours or so. Um, per campaign, um, as I mentioned, the GHRC DAC is almost a 1 stop shop for NASA lightning data. There's a few, um. A few exceptions that I pointed out in, uh, during this talk, uh, and probably the, the best way to think about uh, going for NASA lightning data is to, to both use the GHRC landing site for lightning as well as the NASA Earth data search. Okay, and uh, here are some resources, direct links to the GHRC, to the lightning data sets homepage, Earth data search, and the ISS camera geolocate software for the background imagery. And uh, I think I'll wrap up by just kind of letting you guys watch this video. This is lightning detected by ISS Liz between January 2017 and July 2023. Uh, this video takes several minutes. Um, so um, I encourage folks to, to watch it in its entirety. And um, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Lang, for such a wonderful and informative presentation about lightning measurements and also how to access lightning data. So that brings us to our question and answer session. And just a reminder that uh, we have a, our last session next week on 2nd April. And the same day you will find homework posted on our website, which is due on 17th of April. Again, mentioned earlier, uh, certificate of completion will be provided to everyone who attends uh, live webinar sessions, all three, and complete the homework assignment by the deadline. You will receive a certificate via email approximately two months after completion of the course. Here is our contact information for uh, Dr. Timothy Lang, as well as you can contact RSET for any further information. Uh, RSET website address is here and links to our social media uh, here. Uh, also, our sister programs are uh, developed and served here. You can find more information about it. these links. Again, thank you everybody that's submitting your questions. And if you have one and, and you've not had a chance to submit it, please do. We still have plenty of time. So please, uh, you know, do submit them in the Q&A box and we'll get to them in the order that they were received. So uh, question number one, is data only available for visualization? 
Uh, no. So as you might have seen in the lecture, I showed a little bit of of uh, different options that you can do. One is to download this quick look imagery, kind of browse imagery, and that that's that's good for just kind of understanding. Hey, what what is what do lightning data look like? Was this a particular was this particular day a good day for lightning globally? That sort of thing. Can answer those sorts of questions or, you know, maybe look at some seasonal um, behaviors of lightning, but there's also the underlying data. There are, are also accessible. They are um, in 2 different formats. 1 is net CDF um, and 1 is HDF. Uh, I tend to use the net CDF. That seems to be the easiest to access um, the Python library. X array is very good for just bringing that in immediately and, and starting to work with the data. Uh, so I strongly recommend people look at open source uh, tools for reading uh, net CDF data. Uh, the HDF format is kind of a legacy format. Uh, that was like an older format. As I, as you might have guessed, these data have been around uh, starting back in the 1990s. So they've gone through a few different data formats. And so the HDF is if if you're used to using HDF from um, and it's like an older version of HDF. If you're used used to using that from like the old trim days and that sort of thing, uh, you may have legacy code that works well with that HDF. But if you're just a new user, uh, there's tons of net CDF data that you can download. Um, and uh, so that's the individual orbit granules, but there's also, um, in addition to visualization of the climatology products that we have for both trim Liz and then the combined trim Liz and OTD, and in the future we'll have for both Liz's plus OTD. Uh, those data are also available in, in uh, these standard formats and they're kind of a grid, uh, gridded and then they're split up by seasonal and monthly and that sort of thing, those kind of climatologies. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, and uh, jumping to question number two, this looks like it's in reference to some of the, the trim and ISS based uh, data sets that are provided. So can, can we find any current data for higher latitudes? Yeah, so uh, there are two things here. One is so trim only went up to plus or minus 38. So if we say if we define higher latitude as anything above those latitudes of 38 degrees, then uh, your options there are the OTD data set or the combined OTD and trim climatology data set. Uh, so that's a, so you can either go to the individual OTD granules uh, orbit files, or you can look at the actual climatological climatological products that combine trim with OTD, with OTD essentially populating the higher latitude information. ISS Liz goes up to about 55 degrees. Uh, so a little bit higher latitude, and that is currently available on its own as the individual orbit files. But as I mentioned, by 2025, we hope to combine this with the trim and trim Liz and OTD data set such that we would have uh, a, a long-term climatology that goes up to uh, also includes the higher latitudes, uh, but extends into uh, out through 2023. Great. All right. Thanks so much. Question number three. What is the best tool or resource to plot the movement of a storm in order to assist and or improve the detection of probable forest fires caused by electrical discharges? Yeah, so. Um... There are a number of real time. This is probably something that you'd be interested in real time data or just quick after the fact type data. Um, so, Liz is primarily a climatological product, OTD as well, uh, because these are low earth orbiting satellites. So, they're only viewing an area for a short time period, maybe up to two minutes, uh, and then they're done. And so, you could look at broad-based statistics, uh, climatological statistics with Liz and OTD, but if you're trying to track individual storms or individual fires that might be caused by lightning, uh, in that case, you want to go to um, either the GLM products, the Geostationary Lightning Mapper products, uh, which I think uh, will be talked about at the next training. Uh, that's those are good for the Western Hemisphere. They cover good coverage there. Um, there is a lightning sensor on the Meteosat third generation satellite uh, that just went up um, that covers Africa and Europe. 
Um, so that'll be a forthcoming resource for per people interested in, in fire starts. And then um, there's also data available from uh, commercial data providers, both prof for profit and nonprofit. Um, there's the Woolen data set, that's a nonprofit university data set that's based on ground based sensors, uh, can detect a lot of the strongest cloud to ground flashes. Um, and then there's uh, Visala and Earth Networks are two commercial companies that provide uh, both real time and, and archival lightning data. Um, and again, these have the ground ground based uh, strike information, so that's very useful. Um, those data are typically you got to pay for, um, but there are some options for people doing scientific research. Uh, there are programs that they have where these data are offered either for low cost or no cost. Uh, so I encourage you to to look up those data sets that are not managed by NASA um, and contact the point points of contact for for those data sets and just see what options are available for um, for uh, scientific research. If you're interested in commercial, or or government decision support, usually they charge for those sorts of uh, data. Okay, Dr. Lang, thank you. Question number four, are terrestrial, terrestrial gamma ray flashes dangerous? Um, the best answer there is maybe. Uh, there, like I said, we haven't had a lot of very close up observations of terrestrial gamma rays. Uh, there was one airborne measurement made um, several years ago over a storm in Florida. Um, and then we just made a bunch of observations of TGFs uh, from the Aloft campaign. And so we're still kind of processing those data. Uh, uh, but in, I think the best way to think about this is they may be dangerous if, if you're very close to one, like, you're in an aircraft and one occurs like right outside the aircraft. Um, it's potentially uh, possible that that would be a dangerous dose of radiation. Uh, how dangerous? I'm not sure. Uh, that that remains uh, a subject of research. Uh, but it's important to note that if you are that close inside a thunderstorm in an aircraft, you are already in a very dangerous situation. Uh, you are subject to extreme turbulence, uh, violent winds, uh, hail, uh, lightning strikes on the aircraft, um, which generally don't cause damage, but can, uh, depending on the aircraft. And uh, so those are, are more immediate concerns. Uh, you know, you and as opposed to uh, a radiation dose, which might be a more long term health concern. Um, but uh, suffice to say, we're, we are doing um, additional research on that question, and it's an important research problem. Um, and we don't have a full answer yet, but it's likely that if you are, if they are dangerous. Uh, you'd have to be pretty close to one, and if you're already really close to one, you're already subject to other immediate thunderstorm-based dangers. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lang. Question five. How can we identify the lightning slash thunderstorm using change in electric field, as the electric field can be changed by various factors? Yeah, that's that's an important point. You know, there are um, there's a lot of working objects and mechanical things and electronics in the world these days, and so there's a lot of things putting out electric fields. Um, and so, what's important uh, if you are making a measurement from an electric field sensor is to understand what is your background level. What's what's their noise background level? So, if you're out in a farmer's field that hasn't been uh, cultivated yet or anything like that. It's just kind of sitting out there, fallow field. Usually that's pretty, not a lot of electric, extraneous electric fields out there. You're, you're getting a good sensitive uh, measurement of the background electric field. Uh, or you could be like right next to a building and uh, there's an air conditioner unit right there and it's turning on and off and all that kind of stuff. And so that's, that's causing a lot of uh, interference uh, and so your background there is is a lot stronger. And so what you need to understand is is kind of look at 
when that particular sensor isn't experiencing an electric field due to a thunderstorm, uh, what is just the overall background level? And that'll allow you to assess how, how sensitively you can measure the electric field changes due to a thunderstorm uh, that's nearby or lightning. Uh, so definitely do, do not just analysis during the, if you have some electric field data, don't just analyze when you're right next to the thunderstorm, also analyze when there's not a thunderstorm nearby and try to understand what that background level is. Great, thank you, Dr. Lang. Question six, how can we download data for analysis? Okay, so that's really the, uh, we showed a little bit of example of that. Uh, you can, there are two ways. One is to kind of go into that uh, file, uh, web-based file folder thing where you're kind of pointing and clicking and, and downloading individual files. That's where you get the NetCDF files that are suitable for scientific analysis um or hdf files uh but if you want to do a bulk download you want to get like a year's worth of data or something like that or even a month's worth of data uh, i i strongly recommend going to the nasa earth data website uh just google nasa or nasa earth data search and it should take you there and you um from there you would um enter in the data you're interested in, let's say ISS Liz, you would say ISS Lightning Imaging Sensor, and it will give you a few different options. Uh, most people are gonna be interested in the quality controlled science data. Um, so you look for that particular uh, type of data, and there you can start to say, okay, I want data but for 2023, or I want between 2017 and 2023, or I only want the month of May 2020 something like that. And so you can kind of uh, isolate uh, using the tools on that website, timing, what type of files, do you want both NetCDF and the HDF files? Do you just want HDF? Do you just want NetCDF? Um, do you wanna, you're only interested in certain areas of the earth, you know, like I just wanna look over data over Bangladesh or something. So you can kind of isolate by latitude and longitude coverage. Um, so a lot of ways to kind of drill down and, and figure out what are the orbit granules that are most relevant to you for your scientific needs uh, and your data needs and, and download those specific data. Great. Question number seven. Suppose I have a study area somewhere in the world, roughly 20 square kilometers, and I want to find all occurrences of data for the International Space Station that pertain to that area over a four-year period. What's the most efficient way to approach this search? Yeah, so that's kind of a follow-on to the question, previous question that I answered. And this is where the NASA Earth data search really comes into play uh, because you can make those isolate, you can isolate by, um, I believe, latitude and longitude, by uh, time, and um, type of file and any other, uh, a few other options there. And I think that is the best way to do it, is to use that, that Earth data search um, to, to isolate the data appropriately. And then you'll get a set of files that have the orbits that are relevant to your particular plot of land. And uh, from there, you need to go and read in those data. They, they've been isolated, so you don't have all the orbits that are nowhere near you. But uh, then within those individual orbit files, you do have to go in and read those files and then isolate the only, only the flashes and view times that are relevant to your location. Um, so it's kind of a two-step process there. One is to isolate uh, just the orbits that intersect with your location on the Earth and then from there, you go into those individual orbit files and you just grab the data that are relevant to your particular location. Great. Question number eight. What format is GHRC data in and is it of sufficient spatial resolution to map a region with sparse suborbital lightning detection equipment like Southern Africa? 
Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, there are two separate formats. One is the HDF format and one is the NetCDF format. Uh, for new users, I strongly recommend the NetCDF format. There are a lot of open source tools like X-Ray, et cetera, um, to, to read those data in quite quickly and process them. And um, so in terms of sufficient spatial resolution, um, the native spatial resolution of ISS LIS and trim LIS for that matter is about four kilometers at nadir, uh, maybe six kilometers towards the edge of the swath. So you have kind of a roughly four to five to six kilometer resolution of these individual pixels. And so you can count up the data at that kind of resolution. Um, generally, because lightning's a volatile um, uh, geophysical phenomenon, uh, it makes sense to kind of broaden your area a little bit, uh, your individual grid pixels, and just uh, bin up things that way. And so that's why often when we make these maps or produce these data sets, there we 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 tend to focus on say um, 0.5 degree uh, grid squares um, that that helps kind of sum things up a little bit better at at, at a um, so that it kind of accounts for the the inherent noisiness of making this measurement of a volatile phenomenon from low Earth orbit. That being said, uh, I do want to stress we also have that 10. Uh, point tenth of a degree or ten kilometer product from Trimliz. Um, that's kind of a integrated climatological product from the whole uh, data set. Recall that this um, this satellite lasted uh, about fifteen plus years in orbit, so it sampled areas like southern Africa, for example, quite often, and uh, so it has good enough statistics based on that that we could kind of get away with um, uh, shrinking our, our grid size there and, and kind of looking at just 10 kilometer data. Great, thank, thank you, Dr. Lang. Question number nine, looks like there's a few different questions kind of embedded in this one. So do trim LIS and ISS LIS need similar algorithms to be treated? Which type of detection would be used, such as a vegetation index or water index for the specific wavelength of 777? And what about terrestrial gamma ray flash specific algorithm lasso type sparsity? Yeah, uh, so there's um, trim and ISS LIS, those data structures are virtually identical. So whatever tool you develop to analyze trim LIS data can likely be applied to ISS LIS without much, um, without many changes. Uh, in terms of detection, uh, the good news here is we've already done the detection for you. You don't have to figure it out yourself. Um, so, uh, we, TRIM and ISS LIS and OTD are, are event detectors, and, and the core data product is essentially, like I said, that event, that pixel-based uh, single light-up of a pixel associated with lightning. Uh, and then we've clustered those data for you up to, to groups and then flashes and then thunderstorm areas. Uh, so all that detection has been done for you and you can and you can feel safe and comfortable just working with the flash data or group level data, whatever, whatever your scientific needs are there. Um, so you don't have to worry about uh, developing your own algorithm to, to do the detection. That stuff has already been done for you. Um, and then um, terrestrial gamma ray flash specific algorithm. Um, so TGFs are not, uh, this is gamma ray emission, right? So you don't necessarily see gamma ray emissions in the 777 nanometer uh, that's near, near IR. So uh, instead you're seeing the gamma ray. So you need a separate detector for the gamma rays. Uh, those separate detectors are on a number of different uh, satellites and or suborbital um, instruments. Um, some of the notable ones are the gamma ray burst monitor on the Fermi satellite. GBM is a, um, it's an astrophysics instrument. It's, a, its idea is to look out in deep space and detect gamma ray bursts, uh, but also TGFs are very energetic and they um, trigger that instrument as well, even though it's not quote, looking that direction at the earth. 
Um, so that's one way to detect them. Um, and then uh, the other thing that's that's actually very relevant to ISS Liz is this awesome instrument um, on the space station, it's still there. Um, but it overlapped with Liz between 2018 and 2023. Awesome has gamma ray detectors on it. It is it is one of the first instruments to really just we just want to detect terrestrial gamma ray flashes and it had some combined optical data as well as the gamma ray uh, sensors. And so that's another data set that's available. It's not a NASA data set. It's uh, managed by the Technical University of Denmark. Uh, awesome itself is a uh, European Space Agency mission, ESA. Um, so you have to go uh, look for Awesome ASIM uh, data, uh, search on that, and that should take you to the Technical University of Denmark's uh, website for, for managing those data. Great, thank you, Dr. Lang. Question 10, could there be a correlation between regions with higher lightning occurrence, potentially indicative of elevated aerosol levels in the atmosphere and increased vulnerability of coral reefs to environmental stressors such as climate change and pollution? Um, that sounds like an interesting science question. Uh, I don't know that I anybody has done that specific kind of research, but I'll just speak very generally here. Um, I did mention uh, there's a possibility that aerosol, um, aerosols, atmospheric aerosols, whether natural or anthropogenic, uh, can invigorate convection. And if so, that that could lead to additional lightning flashes that might not have occurred had there not been um, that additional aerosol in the area. Um, so that's that's an active area of research, and it seems like um, you know it's it's a difficult topic because a lot of this stuff is sort of um, convoluted with or convolved with you know thermodynamic. Um, influences on thunderstorms. So uh, in addition to aerosols, you also have, if you have a lot of moisture in the lower atmosphere with some heating, you can trigger thunderstorms that way. And, and that's also got very strong control on whether or not you have lightning. Uh, and so which is more important? Well, that's that's been a, a, a topic of fierce debate and discussion and research for many years. And I don't think we've fully um, uh, come to a, an overall solution. I, I suspect that both things uh, play important roles. Um, now, in terms of coral reefs, that starts to get into things like sea surface temperature. Um, and we do know, and you can see that in some of the maps I showed, that enhanced sea surface temperatures can trigger additional thunderstorms. So like the Gulf Stream, that's actually a notable area of additional lightning and thunderstorms. Uh, and so one could imagine as you in start to increase so, uh, sea surface temperatures, if other ingredients are also in place, you could also maybe enhance thunderstorm activity. Uh, but again, that's a, this is all an area of, of active research. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of opportunities here uh, for people here are in enterprising uh, students or young researchers who wanna make a name for yourselves. Uh, this is something that you could start to look at, like try to figure out this, um, you know, how much do aerosols impact convection versus thermodynamic versus things like sea surface temperature and that sort of thing. Great. And question number 11, when working with Liz data and other few lightning data sets in the past, I found lack of proper Python or any other scripts available to start working with. Any Jupyter notebooks on these data sets available to do the visualization and processing is really appreciated. Yeah, um, we we could do definitely a better job there. The GRTRC does have a few data recipes, so you could search those, um, but uh, there, it's not super um, not super detailed there. Uh, if you are really stuck, uh, you can consider emailing me uh, or the GHRC for additional guidance. Um, but one thing that I find really easy to kind of just get out, out the door, get moving with the data is uh, using the X-Array uh, module to read in Liz data. It reads it in pretty well and reliably. 
and uh, you have immediate access to the data, um, all the different things um, as um, parts of the data object. So, uh, a start with X-Array for reading the data, um, the NetCDF data especially. Um, you can check out a few of the data recipes. I, I agree that they are insufficient. Um, I, now that we're kind of in the closeout period for ISS Liz and working on final data, we do hope to have additional scripts and, and data recipes soon uh, on these sorts of things to help thing, uh, ease the burden on the end user. Um, but in the near term, if there are specific questions you have uh, relative to getting started that aren't answered by, hey, check out the data recipes or, hey, check out X-Array, uh, then you can consider emailing me or someone at the GHRC to, to get assistance with that. Great. Well, Dr. Lang, we, uh, we got through all the questions and we pretty much nailed it in terms of the timing. So great job there. And thank you for everybody that asked these really great questions. As we wrap up uh, this uh, today's webinar, I wanted to give uh, uh, Dr. Lang, if you had any maybe closing thoughts or comments for the participants that were joining today. Uh, no, I, I appreciate everybody um, coming and asking good questions. Like I said, some of these questions are, are a little too good because uh, I don't know the answer to them and uh, really nobody knows the answer to them. And so, uh, like I said, if you're enterprising and want to make a name for yourself, you could do the research to try to answer some of those questions uh, that I was a lot vaguer on. Great. Well, uh, again, thank you so much. Uh, really just a, a terrific presentation and and, uh, and demonstration today. Uh, also want to thank everybody that joined today from wherever you are joining from. Uh, you know, really appreciate it. We hope that you'll join us uh, at the uh, next installment, uh, part three of the webinar series. Uh, also want to acknowledge uh, some other people that contributed to this training. Uh, that's Dr. Christopher Schultz from uh, NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. I also want to acknowledge the RSET team. That's Selwyn hudson Odoy. Brock Blevins, Natasha Johnson Griffin, uh, Jonathan O'Brien, Sarah Ketchall, and of course, Dr. Amita Mekta. And again, uh, Dr. Dr. Lang, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody for part three of the webinar series. So have a great day. No worries. Thanks.